for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. Amen. That's Second Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8, read to our hearing today. As we have looked previously in chapter 4, last week we looked at the emphasis and the priority of preaching. Paul had just given Timothy his last charge that he would ever receive. And he reminded him, Son, things are bad, the times are perilous, days are dark, people are departing from the faith. They're lovers of themselves instead of lovers of God. They're doing their own thing. Things is rough and they're going to continue to get worse. And he says, son, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to preach the Word. And he says, I want you to go and you preach the Word. I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You go preach the Word because the Word is going to be the only source of hope and the only source of light in these dark days you're living in, son. And then he later told him the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine. But they would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And he tells them to watch all things. Make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of the evangelist. And then we come to this portion where Paul gives his last will and testament. And this morning it's interesting and I'm... Verse 6 just grabbed my attention as I read this text. I'm going to read it one more time, just verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. This morning, the emphasis on these three verses, 6, 7, and 8 is, Are you now ready to die? Are you ready to die? Are you now? Now! At this moment, now! Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. It's at hand. When he means it's at hand, it's right before me. Now we've got this foolish idea that if I'm young... I'm invincible till I get in my 50s, 60s, or 70s. That's hogwash. That's hogwash. There is an appointment with death for everybody in this room. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this to judge. And Paul is saying, I am now ready to be offered. I'm now ready to be done. What, what he means by this offer, I'm ready to be sacrificed because he's in prison on death row waiting for Nero to cut his head off. Now the average Christian, if they were on death row fixing to be beheaded for the cause of Christ, no, oh, please pray, God to get me out of here. I don't want to die. Do you not believe heaven? Do you not believe Jesus is God? Do you not believe the Word of God? Do you not believe how wonderful heaven's going to be? Oh, then we've got a problem. Every, hey, listen, everybody I know wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Is there fear in the back of your mind about dying? Paul's looking death in the eyeballs and he's ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? What a beacon of hope in a dark time. Paul's been locked in this prison. He's on death row. He knows he's going to die. And he says, I'm ready. I am now ready to be offered. Thing you and I need to understand that when the last grain of sand goes through God's hourglass for mine in your life, we will exit this world whether you're ready or not. Death is no respecter of persons. I've seen caskets this big 
And I've had them seen special ordered because the person was relatively large. I've seen day old babies die. And I've seen 90 something year old people die. I've seen 20s and 30s and teenagers and preteens. You just think, we live in a society that thinks whatever. They think tomorrow is just going to rise like it did today. But the fact is, you're taking that for granted. You and I may never live to see tomorrow. Amen. You may, 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 may not never live to see tomorrow. What if today was your last day? Are you ready for eternity? You need to know that. Your family needs to know that. Me as your pastor, I need to know that you know that you are ready. Because if I know that you know you're now ready, that helps me. That will help your family when they put you in the grave. The grieving will be hard, but it will be better knowing they're with Jesus. It will hurt that gone, but boy, you'll be envious. I can't wait to go myself. We are tying our stakes too firmly to this world. We're trying to make this heaven here. It will never be heaven here till Jesus comes again. So, are you ready? Are you now ready to die? And here's the thought process I had to go through. How does a man get now ready to die? That, that's a good question that we'd like to have the answer to, wouldn't it? How do I get to the place where I no longer fear death? Here's how. I just done an inventory check on the Apostle Paul's writings. If you're taking notes, you can jot them down. I'll add them to our prayer group digital format where you can have them. But 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul said, I die daily. 2 Corinthians 4, 10, Paul said, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. Philippians 1, 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and die is gain. Philippians 1, 23 through 24, he says, For I'm in a straits between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The last verse would be Galatians 2, 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Why go through that? Paul learned the secret to have a happy and a holy life and why he could face death and not be afraid because the whole sum of the Christian life is you've got to die in order to live. Paul had learned to die to himself. He learned to die to Satan. He learned to die to sin. He learned how to die to suffering. And ultimately, he learned how to die to this old sin-sick society he's living in. When Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, he didn't go around and say, that, that mean old slew foot, that old raggedy devil's after me. No. He said, God sent that thorn. We do a lot of good when we quit giving the devil credit for what God's working in our life. Amen. The devil is not omnipotent and he's not omnipresent. If it's hard for me to believe when people say, well, all the devil's after me. Oh, really? You out of seven million people in all the world, the devil just happened to pick you today. And if you actually got the 
pride to think the devil's really on your back, you're in trouble. Well, there's a lot more people that you don't know about that are doing way more for the cause of Christ that gives the devil heartburn every day. And you and I, he's not worried about us because we're in America. We're not suffering persecution. We're not giving the devil any problems at all. Amen. You're not on the devil's hit list. Trust me. <laughs> That's, I, that ain't what Papa said or old so-and-so said. I'm telling you, folks. We might as well trash that idea. The devil's not after Paul. This is the will of God. It's the will of God. Oh, I, I just have a hard time believing this is the will of God. Well, it is the will of God for you and me to suffer. Yeah. Read your Bible. I mean, if you missed this week, you missed it. He showed us plain as day, twice in First Peter. It's the will of God to suffer. Yeah. And it's the will of God you die. So what have you done with Christ? That's the whole emphasis. Now, I've got that out of the way. So let's look at this text real quickly. Three things. Number one, we see the time of Paul's departure. Verse 6. This is how he's now ready because it's time. There's been times I wasn't ready. But the times I realize that I am ready to do that, it's because the grace of God is more abundant in my life. When it comes time to die, there is a thing called dying grace. When it comes time to live, there's a thing as living grace. There's a grace for every time, every season under God's heaven. But notice what the text says in verse 6. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. Now speaks of the imminency of it. It means the immediacy of it. It means I at this present moment am ready to be offered. Now this word ready, I looked it up. We overlook this idea of what ready is. It means an eager willingness and preparedness. <laughs> uh oh. Paul says for I am now ready. Eager Willing and prepared to what? Be offered. This idea of offering speaks of sacrifice. This isn't the only time Paul spoke of being offered and being sacrificed. He did admonish us in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 1, that by the mercies of God, brethren, I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's a living sacrifice? It means I'm offering myself to God. Are you listening? A dead sacrifice God takes no pleasure in. He's looking for me. You mean to tell me, God, if He if it is His will for me to lay down my life for the cause of Christ to willingly be offered? Yes. Did He not do the same for you? Oh yeah. Oh no, 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 no. See, that's that's what God does. Oh really? You you must not read church history. You must not read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. You must not have read Hebrews chapter number 11. Oh. See, we, we, we don't know much about this idea of being ready to be offered. This man was so bold in his lifetime, he would stare the tyrants in the face and he would preach, Thus saith the Lord, and tell them their whole empires are ready to collapse and they're going to die and perish and go to hell. He didn't pull no punches. He called it like it was, whether they was the potentate or whether they were the prison guard. The fact is, he's got something the church needs today. We're wanting to go into hiding. Oh, I better not say nothing. The early church went to jail for what they believed in. 
In 2022, it's hard to get people even to come to church for what they believe in. The time of Paul's departure, he's got this eager willingness to die. What? That, that's almost an oxymoron in our day, isn't it? You let a saint get sick, and everybody wants to go, God, turn this thing around. Have you ever wondered if this may be God's exit plan for their life, and you're praying, fighting God's will? Yeah. We, we might need to just step back and say, God, I don't know what you want. If you want to raise them up, you will. And if you want to carry them home, you carry them home. Whichever you decide, we'll be happy with. Yeah, yeah. When's the last time a prayer meeting turned out like that? Uh oh. I'm meddling now. Well, you just wait till one of your family members do. Oh, I did. I got over my grandma who had been suffering and I see you. She knew the Lord. She was ready. To, I said, God, just please put an end to this suffering and carry her home to be with you. Amen. And then people in that room looked at me like I was crazy. You want to know something? When you know the resurrection and the life. When you know death is not the end, it's just the beginning for the child of God. And you know she's going to a land. Hallelujah. Where there is no night. Uh, where the Lamb's going to be the light. Uh, where the Son of God uh, is there on the throne moment by moment. And they will be at King Jesus' feet praising Him through the countless ages waiting for our arrival. I say hallelujah to the Lamb of God, uh, the Savior of the world, uh, who can save the most violent sinner and set the captive free. And when it comes time to die, I'm glad we can be like Jacob and lean on our staff, raise our hands toward heaven, and shout while passing through the air. The world does not have this. And very few so-called Christians have this. But if you're afraid of dying, you've got a problem. Number one, you don't believe what you say you believe. Or number two, you don't got what you say you got. Oh, I don't want to leave this world. What's here for the child of God? Amen. Nothing. Amen. What about my family? Have you done all you can to get your family in in case Jesus comes today? We, we, this is where we are. The time of Paul's departure. He said he had accepted his fate. And what I want to say before I move on to the next phrase in verse 6 is simply this. Paul didn't say, I'm ready now to be executed. Ready now to be offered. Amen. Paul seen his death as an offering to the Lord. How do you view death as some deadly disease taking life, or you see it as God's call out of this life and the life to come? Most people take option one. And that's why, oh God, this can't be happening. We're faithful to church. We carry the right Bible. We tithe. We give. We work in the church. Why is this happening? That ain't got nothing to do with God's will for calling somebody home, folks. When it's your time, it's your time. He says, for my departure is at hand. Now I looked up this word departure. And it gives us a vivid four word pictures to describe this word departure and to get its full meaning. Now, I can't remember all of it, so I'm going to do a little reading, okay? Here it is. It's come out of my Bible dictionary. Number one, it is a word for unyoking an animal from the cart or the plow. What's that got to do with death? It means, hallelujah, we're about to enter in rest. Our work is done. Hey, listen, Vince Gill had it right. Go rest high on the mountain. <laughs> hey, hey, death is deliverance from the battle we've been raging. The fight that we've been fighting. Uh, oh, boy, the immense struggle that we've struggled along. Uh, we 
wondering why. And we say we'll understand it better by and by. Well, Paul said it's about by and by time for him. He says, I'm getting this yoke off. And I'm entering into the rest that's in Christ. Woo! When we get done with this word departure, some of y'all are going to say, even so, come quickly, Lord. The second meaning for this word depart in this word picture, it's a word for the loosing of the bonds, fetters, or chains. Not only is death a rest, but death is a release. Every morning I get up and I look at my worst enemy in the mirror. The number one problem in my life is me. And one day, as Paul said this mortal, is going to put on immortality. And this corruption, he's going to put on incorruption. Woo! The chains will be broken all together. You see, salvation is past, it's present, and it's future. We have been saved through justification. The moment you came repenting and believing, you were saved. We are justified by faith. Therefore, we have peace with God. We are now at this present time being being saved from the power of sin known as sanctification. This is the lifelong process where we struggle alone, we endure the hardships, we struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we are ready to pull our hair out. Some of us have, by the way. And we're at wit sin. Does that describe your life? That's sanctification. And we are currently being delivered from the power of sin. But there's one more step to salvation. We will be saved, and that's through the process of glorification. This is when we are changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when we lay down this robe of flesh and take on this new and glorious body, or when the death, when we are bodies laid in the grave, our soul is going to be with Jesus, waiting for the resurrection. It's a release. The third word picture is a word for loosening the ropes of a tent. Oh yeah. Woo, yeah. Glory to God. Somebody, I'm glad somebody's getting a hold of this. Other than me. He's taking up his earthly tent. He's taking up his stakes from the ground. Paul talks about this earthly tabernacle. He ain't talking about a tent. He's talking about this body. Amen. Amen. What he's actually telling us is that when we're the time of our departure is at, God is taking up the ropes that's holding us here. And we're about to get tugged on from the glory world. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Glory! And we're about to take a trip on the good old gospel ship, son. And we're going to go sailing through the sky. Are you ready for that? Well, this last one's really going to get you. The fourth word picture for this word depart that's found in our scripture is a word for loosening of the ropes of a ship. It means taking up the anchor and setting sail. Paul had been on several shipwrecks. He had spent many nights on sea. But there's one last trip Paul's got to take. He's got to sail through the sea of death and cross Jordan's chilling river to get to a land that is fairer than they. So what happens when the child of God dies? Well, there's rest, there is release. Oh yes, there is rejoicing and there is re-innovation. There is renewal because we're not only packing up and moving out, but we're setting sail never to come back again. Amen. No wonder the songwriter said, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And I believe we need to make a correction here. It ain't the angels beckoning me. It's Jesus beckoning me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. (laughs) When He calls your name, 
you're gone. Just like the day He called your name and you came. He's going to call your name one more time and you're going to be gone. If it's today, are you ready? Oh yes. The time of my departure is at hand. So, what does this mean? Death is a laying down of the burden in order to rest. It's laying aside the shackles in order to be free. It's, uh, it is dismantling of a temporary campsite in order to take up permanent residence in heaven. It is the casting of the ropes and the pulling up of the anchor which bind us to the world in order to set us on the voyage that's going to end in the presence of a thrice holy God. Whew. Even so, come quickly. The testimony of Paul's devotion in verse 7 he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul does sure do use a lot of eyes right here. But according to his testimony working up to this point, he says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I the Christ. Amen. Paul time and time again is going to say that it's Christ that works in us to will and undo of His good pleasure. It's Christ that's working in us, for us, and through us. So I believe when Paul's saying, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith. You know what I think Paul's doing, really? Because I understand Paul's writings. He's just giving glory to God. It's because of Christ I was able to keep it. It's because of Christ I fought that good fight. It's because of Christ I finished my course. Oh, yes. Don't ever think you're doing something. If you're allowed to do anything, it's God doing it, folks. John 15 and 5, Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. So listen to Paul's testimony. Paul testifies of his life and service to his Lord since he had been saved. And what he's saying here is that in verse 7, he's fought the good fight. He made mention of that in 1 Timothy 6, 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. He was writing I want to know, don't, don't tell me how you used to fight. Are you in the fight now? So many people think when they get a certain age, it's time for them to just sit there, sit, soak, and sour until Jesus comes. God saved you and called you. His gifts and callings are without repentance. You be faithful to Jesus comes or you leave. Oh, you, you just don't understand. Oh, I, I perfectly understand. Things get hard. Things get difficult. There's nowhere to quit on God. Fight the good fight of faith. Finish your course. Keep the faith. One of our former presidents, I believe Theodore Roosevelt said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled. We've got plenty of those kind of people. Or where the doer of the deeds could have done better. We've heard that before. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. Who, who does actually try to do the deed, who spends the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring something greatly. You'll never do nothing sitting down criticizing everybody else. Get up and do something for the glory of God. God didn't save you to sit on a pew. Every person in the body has a purpose. So let's get on board and work till Jesus comes. We've sat back long enough. We've slept long enough. It's high time to awake out of our sleep. The enemy's already among us. And it's time to raise the battle fly, the cry again. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of eternal life. Finish our course. Keep the faith in these dark days. Paul does. Listen to what he also says. He says, Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checked by failure, 
than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. They're somewhere in the middle. I believe he has this text in mind when he makes this statement, or maybe he has Revelation 3, 14 through 21 in mind. Laodicea. There's no fence straddling. You either in it or you ain't in it. You either hot or you cold. And if you're somewhere in between, God said, I'm going to spew, vomit you out of my mouth. I fought a good fight. <coughs> I think <clears throat> about those who's had to fight. There's people who have fought for America. That's what Memorial Day is about, to recognize them. But more importantly than fighting for our country, there's been men who fought for Christ. You know that countless and scores of men died getting an English translation of the Bible. They were like Paul. They were now ready to be offered. The time of their day. They fought the good fight of faith. They fought till they left this world. It had been a William Hendrickson. I, I tell you, I, I've read so much this week, but he makes this wonderful quote uh, uh, telling us in, in, in brief details about Paul's fight. He said that Paul's fight had been against Satan, against principalities, powers, the world rulers of darkness in the heavenly places, against Jewish and pagan vice and violence, against Judaism among the Galatians, against fanaticism among the Thessalonians, against contention, fornication, and legitimacy, uh, and litigation rather, among the Corinthians, against Gnosticism among the Ephesians and Colossians, against fightings without and fears within, but last but not least, against the law of sin and death that warred even within Paul. All. May I re reiterate what Lester Roloff used to say? It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Being a Christian ain't for the faint of heart. You may be called to die for what you believe in. The faithful Christian is always in the battle. He says, I finished my course. And I kept the faith. Real quickly, we, we want to just... We all understand that he's accomplished God's will for his life and it's time for Paul to leave. And when he says, I've kept the faith, it means <clears throat> he has persevered. He has been preserved. My dear friend, let me just tell you and remind you of this. This is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. He that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Amen. This is eternal security of the believer. If you ever got in, you will be in, and you will stay in, and God's got you, and you are saved. And eternally secure in Christ. Amen. Now, he says, I finish my course. In 1904, a man by the name of William Borden. He was the son of the man who started Borden Dairy Company. Upon graduating high school, as a graduating gift from his father and mother, the Borden sent William Borden off on a cruise around the world. What a graduation gift. But when he got to the east, the far east, where the Muslims are, he began to be heartbroken and feel the compelled and called to go back and be a missionary to win these Muslims to Christ. Upon returning from the cruise, he told his parents, I'm 
I've got a scholarship to Princeton University. It was at one time the best university to go to. And in William Borden's days, it was the number one school in America. And William Borden went to Princeton and got his undergraduate degree, which is a bachelor's. And he went on and got his master's and he went into the seminary part of the Princeton University to be a missionary. He spent seven years in school and then he journeyed down to Egypt to learn the Muslim language as he was fixing to go to back to the Far East. But while in Egypt, while in Egypt, while in Egypt, he contracted a deadly disease and within a month's time he was dead. And people said, what a waste. They got his Bible and got it to his father. His father was all upset. But there was a journal writing in the back of his Bible. On his his graduation cruise, when he felt God call him to the mission field, he wrote in the back of his Bible, on this day, God called me to the mission field to these Muslims. No reserve. No reserves. No plan B's. No 401K's. No inheritance. Nothing. This is God's will for my life. He comes back and tells his family and his family is just irate with him because he's the heir. He's supposed to take the family business and his father gets so angry he says, son, you're out. You're out of the will. And then William Boehm in the back of his Bible on this day, I lost my inheritance because I wouldn't do what my earthly father wanted me to do. And he put no retreats. Say what? And the last thing, entry that he had in the back of his Bible was three days before he died. And he wrote two words. See, William Boyle had learned a lesson we all need to learn. He never made it to where he was supposed to go. And everybody says he failed. God doesn't grade on success. He grades on faithfulness. Success ain't up to you. It's up to God. What is up to me? Obedience. How faithful are you? How obedient are to you? To the Lord? Yeah. Good question. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey me. The triumph of Paul's destiny is real simple in verse number 8. He says, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. Henceforth, there, goes back to verse 7, because God had caused this in Paul's life that God was at work causing him to fight the good fight. God was causing him to keep the faith and to finish his course. And he says, because I have come to the time of my life where I must die, he says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that Love is appearing. Now this crown of righteousness. Interesting. So I've done some digging in it. How are we even righteous in the first place? And if you think it's something you've done, you've missed it. We're righteous because of His righteousness. It was imputed on our behalf the moment... We came to faith in Christ. So all this one of our rewards. Yes. I've been 
fixing to pop some of y'all's bubbles, but that's okay. All believers get this crown. Because if you don't have righteousness, the wedding garment, you don't get in. How so? I don't believe that. Everybody we've heard our whole lives say, this is for a special club. No, it ain't. It's for anybody who believes in Jesus. <laughs> the nonsense with that legalistic nonsense. They need to read their Bible. <laughs> Paul speaks of this crown of righteousness. Come to find out, James speaks of the same crown. He calls it a crown of life. Huh? Not a different crown, same crown. Peter calls it a crown of glory that fades not away. How else are we going to have life and glory if we do not have the crown of righteousness? There's not four different crowns, there's one. I don't believe that. You need to go back and read Matthew 20, 1 through 16. You remember the landowner? The parable Jesus taught about the landowner. He hired men at all different times of the day. Some before daylight, some a few minutes before dark. Are y'all listening? At the end of the day, every one of them received the same way. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. If that don't help your heart, you dead, lost in sin, that help my heart that hey, 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 it's not dependent on me, but it's all dependent on Christ, His righteousness, His sacrifice. That's why He can say, tell he has to die, paid in full, it is finished, son. There's nothing left to do but trust and obey. <laughs> he says, wish the righteous judge shall give me on that day. And a day of unrighteous judge and judges in poor court systems. I'm glad one day. Are you listening? I'm glad one day. Everybody, me, you, the saved, and the lost, will stand before a righteous judge. Amen. That's scary. It ain't if you got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Who is the propitiation? That word propitiation means the appeasement of wrath. It means hallelujah. Though we're guilty, we're forgiven because of Him. And for saved people on that day, on that day, we won't be judged by our sinfulness will be judged by Christ's righteousness. Amen. And what we've done with what God gave us. It's called stewardship. Amen. Yeah. How are you using what God gave you? But Paul says, I'm going to stand and not me. But I, he, he says this phrase and I'm done. All them that love is appearing. Any and all that love Jesus Christ come. You know it's a world of people who ain't looking for Jesus to come again. They're not wanting Jesus to come again. You know why? They don't love God. They love their sin. They love this old world. They love being themselves. And they see no need to be saved. But when I read in the book of Revelation, it's going to get so bad down here that these men are going to cry for the mountains and rocks to fall on them. They're going to want to die. And can't die. Hmm? That's the bad side. The good side is if you'll call upon the Lord this morning and ask Him to save you by His grace. You put faith in Him. You won't have to face that. Because death will be no longer your enemy. It will be the entrance to the first time in your life where you really live. Hmm? Everybody in this room has some physical problem. Young or old, you've got an infirmity. 
but the place we're going for the saved. No infirmities. No eyeglasses. No contact lenses. No false teeth. No walking sticks. No wheelchairs. No hearing aids. Them quadriplegic babies that ain't never learned how to run, boy, they'll get to run. I just spent my time telling you, here's a man looking at death and face to face and all he can think about what waits him the moment his head gets cut off. And he's not complaining about having to die. Amen. Wake up. Reality check. Do you got what Brother Paul had? And if not, you better get it fixed because you may not make it home again. Jesus may come today. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you. And because I know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, Paul says. You don't have tomorrow. You have now. How do you know? 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation I have secured, which means help thee. Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So you almost persuaded me. Or you say, I'll wait a more convenient time. Time ain't on your side. At any given moment, Jesus is going to say, that's it. And you're dead. Are you born again? Are you ready to die? Let's stand to our feet. Father.